So hello and welcome to Mia O'Toole. Um, so Mia, you are Associate Professor at Aarhus University and you can give a brief introduction in a couple of seconds. Um, so the reason we are meeting here today talking uh, is uh, about some, you and some of your colleagues have done studies on uh, comparative studies on the effects of power posing, submissive posing, neutral posing even. Mm -hmm. uh, and it all comes down to the 2010 study uh, conducted by uh, Amy Cuddy, Andy Yap, and Dana Carney uh, from University of Columbia and uh, Howard University. Uh, so just to recap, I think uh, a lot of people have seen the TED Talk with Amy Cuddy, is the second or third highest viewed on, on TED Talks. Uh, basically, what they found, I think they took 26 females and 16 males, and they made them do um, power poses for two minutes, uh, where they had expansive body postures and mm -hmm. low power poses with more contracted uh, body postures for two minutes. And before each of those poses, they took saliva samples on, uh, to measure their testosterone level, um, and their cortisol level, the stress hormone. And after the poses, they took another saliva sample and tested for the same hormones to see if there was any effect. Uh, further, they tested the participants' uh, risk willingness in terms of a short gambling exercise. Uh, and just to recap the findings, uh, the people who had been in a power pose uh, were 86% uh, of them tended to take the gambling uh, opportunity and the low power posers, uh, only 60% of them took the gambling exercise, uh, which suggested that people who had been in a high power pose would be more risk tolerant and more prone to be actionable, uh, whereas uh, the low power posers would be more um, uh, risk averse and more uh, sort of opposed to taking uh, risks. On the hormonal level, uh, they found that uh, the high power poses had an increase in 20%, approximately 20% in testosterone, and a decrease in cortisol on, I think it was um, 25%. And then the low power poses had the opposite effect with testosterone decreasing about 10% and cortisol spiking at around 15%. And furthermore, the participants then uh, were asked to state if they felt more comfortable, more powerful, uh, et cetera. And the high power poses felt more confident, more powerful than the low power poses. Now, this became like a huge thing uh, in 2010, 2011, and especially when the TED Talk came out. Um, and a lot of people like myself and others have like taught this study to people. Uh, then a lot of other researchers started to replicate the studies and we had a variety of results coming in. Uh, and then you and your colleagues decided to, to sort of make a status on the whole power pushing effect. So right. if you could just give a brief intro to yourself and then mm -hmm. talk about what is the status on the power pushing research uh, right yeah. now. Yeah, well, as you said, my name is Mia O'Toole and I'm an associate professor here at Aarhus University. Um, my area is clinical psychology, emotions, anxiety, stress, depression, psychotherapy. And from the very get go, I've always been interested in the role of the body in emotions, the role of the body in psychopathology. And so actually my entryway into this field wasn't that 2010 study that you just mentioned. My entry into the field was some studies that had uh, mapped bodily movements and posture in depressed individuals, where they saw that they had like bigger arm swings, they were bobbing up and down with their heads a little more, they had a slower gait and all that stuff, and that that could be normalized following or somewhat normalized following a course of mindfulness treatment. And I just thought that was the most fascinating thing in the whole world. Um, but then my research career took me uh, via some different paths. Um, 
but now I'm back to exploring the role of the of the body and emotions. And so uh, two years ago, I was lucky enough to um, get a grant from Vilux Foundation to explore some of these core issues more in depth. And as prep for this kind of work, we decided to do a so-called meta-analysis. So we wanted to look and um, we wanted to look at all this, the studies out there, all the available studies and create a synthesis, you know, like what's the average effect of these kinds of poses when you look across studies. And so um, we, we did that and we found a little over 70 studies. And the first thing we noticed was that a lot of the studies had not included a group that would assume a neutral posture. Mm. So, so the, the um, most frequent thing they'd done would, was to compare expansive or high power poses where you sit like this, or you have yeah. your hands on your hips, uh, with contractive uh, poses or low power poses. But they had failed to include a neutral group. And of course, as researchers, when we interpret those results, we, we, we cannot state if it's the absence of the contractive displays or the presence of the expansive displays that are, um, that are driving the effect because the, the effect is there. In my, in my mind, there's no doubt that an effect is there. We see it uh, all the time when you compare expansive to contractive poses, there's an effect on self-reported mood and emotions, and there's an effect on the behavioral propensity to take certain actions. The mm -hmm. hormonal effect is a different story, um, but, but, but those two effects are quote unquote real if you, if you ask me. But what we saw was that when we looked at the studies that had also included a neutral group and we could only find 12 studies that did that, then there was a fairly large effect between uh, comparing the contractive group with the neutral group whereas there was close to no effect comparing the neutral and expansive uh, group. And so later on, I talked about these findings with a journalist and, and her take on it was this like, don't go big, just don't go small. And I thought that was kind of like a nice recap of what we, what we found in that uh, meta-analysis. So I, I think what you're basically saying is that there is a mood effect to some extent that people who have uh, power poses uh, tend to feel and self-report uh, feeling more comfortable, more powerful. Uh, whereas if you are contracted, you tend to become uh, less confident, less um, feelings of, of powerful. Yet what you're saying is that uh, maybe uh, the, the effects of power posing comes as well if you just pose neutral. Right. Right. So, 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 so the most important thing, if these 12 studies, you know, are uh, showcasing uh, a robust effect, I mean, we don't know, it's 12 studies. And as a researcher, I have to, you know, like list a long, a long line of limitations. But let's say that was true. Then the take home message is whatever you do, just don't assume a contractive posture. That's the take home message. We can't say that if you assume a high power pose, that you will feel a certain way, the results point towards just don't assume a contractive um, mm -hmm. posture. So the, the original research, I think, gained a lot of attention also because of the hormonal uh, <laughs> factors. You know, it, it, it became very interesting if you could really change your chemistry in your body uh, by acting in a certain way mm -hmm. or posing in a certain way. Uh, so. Has there been conclusive studies showing that there was a hormonal effect, but it has been too insignificant in, in the total amount of studies conducted? We were only able to detect a handful of studies and the findings were mixed. And um, yeah, it, it just is like in larger replication studies of that, of that original finding, they haven't been able to replicate the results. And in the additional studies that we found, um, we weren't uh, able to, um, to, to detect any differences at the hormonal level. And I think this, this finding has gained so much attention, positive attention and negative attention. And I think it, from my perspective, it is very uncontroversial to say that what we do has a hormonal effect. Just like if you, administer 
hormones to people, they start behaving in a different way. Mm -hmm. I think, I think this research design may not capture it. You may not be able to change your overall, uh, uh, I mean, like a hormonal state after like two minutes of assuming a, a, a posture. But I think that, so, 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 with, so with all that said, you know, like we don't know anything about that. And maybe that's a null effect and that's just the way that it is. But, but, but of course, like, you know, what we do and what we say has a hormonal effect, you know, and we, we know that, you know, yeah. that's, how, that, that's how we work as human beings, you know, yes. but it's probably more complicated than to say, if you assume this posture, then your testosterone goes up and then you're risk willing, and then you will have success in life, you know? Yeah, yes, sure. Uh, so, but we can also conclude that it definitely doesn't hurt to assume a power pose before a meeting or before an interview or anything. Like that. I, unless, unless I, I, I reckon sure about that. the studies have shown that if you are in a negative mood prior to do, uh, doing the power pose, it can have a negative effect, right? Right. So that's the other thing that we found that I that I find so intriguing. You know, just as as intriguing as a 2010 study because it connects with. Uh, our everyday phenomenology, you know, that when we need a little boost, we do this, you know, uh, and it also feels so wrong to do that if we are experiencing something that is truly painful. It almost feels like we are violating our own personal boundaries by doing something so opposite, right? So, so what we found was something that we called a contingency effect or a context effect. And these studies, they go way back, also before 2010. They're back in the 70s and 80s, where they show that if you, if you feel really bad for whatever reason, just because you feel bad or the researchers have made you feel bad, then it is worse for you to adopt an expansive posture than it is to adopt a contractive posture. So in my book, whether a, an expansive posture would help you or not, let's say an exam situation or job interview, depends very much on your motivational state uh, going into it. That if you're super anxious, super scared, super this, super that, um, maybe, maybe it would be too much to jump to an expansive uh, posture. In psychotherapy, and this is where the two fields, they, you know, they, 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 they um, they're so important for me that the, to have the kind of like the basic science be informed by the clinical science and vice versa. Because mm. in clinical psychology, one of my absolute favorite uh, research and therapists, um, Greenberg, his name is, he says, you have to arrive at a place before you can leave it. Mm. So you kind of have to connect with that emotion that you don't want. Like you have to connect it, honor it see what what's at stake before you can leave it you know and maybe from a bodily language perspective maybe you have to connect with that thing that is painful and and that hurts you before you can then open up again to the world you know and 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 be inviting and uh, and expansive or however you want to yeah so so definitely i i i think there's a lot uh, uh, with the whole mental state that you need to connect with the emotion, but also maybe learn some techniques on how to let go of uh, of bad thoughts or anxiety, you know, like uh, cognitive psychology or some of these um, practices where you, you you are taught to to handle emotions uh, well um, and sit with them, but also let them go and not let them uh, dwell in. Uh, so maybe uh, we don't know this perhaps, but maybe we should make like a three step rocket where you if you are feeling anxious you are feeling down you are feeling somewhat depressed or stressed that you actually embrace that by accepting a body posture of that current state of emotion then perhaps you adopt meanwhile doing a mental exercise you adopt a neutral posture before mm -hmm. you adopt an expansive posture so that you sort of grow into both bodily and mentally into another state of mind. Um, maybe that could be worth examining. Yeah, I mean, those are some really interesting thoughts. Uh, like along those lines, we just finished um, a, an experimental study where we put people in personal ideographic motivational dilemmas because that is something that that we found was missing from the literature. It is, it is these experimental tasks 
a mock job interview, solving a puzzle where you see how persistent you are, whatever it is. But it's it's these um, tasks that have been cited by the experimenter that may or may not be very personally relevant for you. You know, if you a, a mock job interview, if it doesn't have any personal relevance relevance for you you know like you have a job and you're fine with that you know maybe maybe you don't engage more in that task so we thought okay let's let's run an experiment where we ask people to identify a motivational dilemma that that was current and relevant in their life so it could be i want to call my friend because it's important i really want to call her uh, it's i miss her it's a long time since i talked to her whatever but i I'm a little scared about it or worried because the last time we spoke, it was a little awkward. Or, you know, I need to like reach out to someone. I need to go to the gym, but I'm scared what people, if people look at me, whatever, you know. But this motivational dilemma where there was, where there's both approach and avoidance. And the, the hypothesis was that, that an expansive posture will be better for you than a neutral posture if it fit the context. Yeah. So if it is about me engaging with the world, going for something that's important, going for something that I want, that then I need that little bit of extra oomph in my bodily language and just the, 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 the neutral uh, posture. And so far, it, it looks as if that hypothesis um, is being confirmed, that there are certain settings where an expansive posture is better than assuming a neutral posture. Mm. No, very interesting. Uh, so I actually used in my younger years, I'm, I'm 43 now, so I'm, maybe I'm still qualifying as somewhat young, but when I was even younger, um, I, uh, when I were entering a scene, giving a speech, uh, teaching people I, I didn't know, actually maybe even people that I somewhat looked up to, um, I had this trick uh, mentally that I carried around a piece of paper where I had printed statements that people have said to me over the years, uh, like professors and leaders, et cetera, uh, that I would read to myself uh, prior to going on stage. And then at the same time, I would work with my body posture, meanwhile working on my mental state. So I think the whole thing we talked about a couple of minutes ago, where you you need to see it in context, but also in, in a union between mind control and body control, and then see if you can fit those two pieces of puzzles together. Maybe that is where you will reap the highest benefits. I think so, because I, like whenever we, uh, we all have so much personal experience with the way that we sit and act that it almost, it determines uh, the possibilities of our thoughts and emotions. Not a hundred percent, you know, but like, but it kind of like, it shapes it. We know from before anyone did experimental research from, you know, philosophical roots, you know, that, that our bodily posture and physical placement in the world constrains and guides our emotions and thoughts, you know, so, so that, so there is this idea that it determines to some extent, the possibilities of the thoughts and emotions that you can that you can have, right? Not a hundred percent, but it guides you. And yes. so, when you sit in a contractive posture, that guides, you know, that you you meet the world from that perspective, you know, and, and it guides the the thoughts and emotions that are, um, yeah, that are that that are possible, you know. Just as when you have th uh, thoughts and emotions, that that those thoughts and emotions are accompanied by certain bodily reactions that then feed back into the next, you know. So, so it really is, uh, we, we, we all often talk, talk about as two kind of separate entities that work with the body or with the mind. But when we work with the body, we work with the mind. When we work yeah. with the mind, we work with the body, right? Yeah. Uh, but of course, from, a, from an analytic perspective, you know, and from points of, of entry into facilitating change, we talk about it as, as different entities. Yeah, so, so it, it, it's very interesting. So I, I, as you know, I come from, from the world of negotiation and conflict resolution, and there tends to be some research suggesting that the people who are in a positive mood tend to be more collaborative and more uh, prone to problem-solving uh, negotiations, et cetera. Uh, so the reason we, we talk about this whole body language thing is all of the screws that are on the bike that we can, you know, uh, tighten to make the bike ride smoother, 
the better. So when we talk about uh, emotional uh, intelligence or emotional control and, and bodily control, it, it very much comes down to how can we enhance our uh, performance internally, but also externally. And in the in the TED talk of, of Amy Cuddy, uh, she talked about, and, and uh, the two of us have touched upon that prior to this meeting, uh, she talked about a study where they asked people to do a power pose before mm -hmm. they went in front of a camera uh, being interviewed by a neutral uh, interviewer. And then uh, other people were adopting a low power pose before uh, attending the camera and being interviewed by a neutral interviewer. Uh, and then afterwards, those video recordings were viewed by some non-primed uh, viewers of the video who were to rank which of the interviewees they liked the most. And it, uh, uh, as what I understand from the TED talk, it turned out that most of the people who were uh, ranked thumbs up were the people who before being recorded had adopted a power pose. And those who were uh, turned down were the people who had adopted a low power pose. Is there anything we can say about that uh, from your findings with your colleagues in your meta-analysis? Right. Well, it's one of the studies that we ended up including, and I think it falls in that big pool of studies that didn't have a neutral comparison group, as far as I remember. So, so again, we're, we're left with this question, like what's, what's, what's the take home message? Is it that it's important that you are helpful for you that you assume an expansive posture before doing X, Y, and C, or is it, or is a more fair interpretation that it's important that you don't do a contractive pose before doing that? And I think it has huge, uh, it's, 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 it's hugely important to be able to answer that question. And because, because if we want to give people good advice, maybe it's maybe for some people, it will feel more normal, natural. It will feel easier to not be contractive than it would be adopting an, an expansive posture. Right. So, so how, like, so what's the most precise advice that we can give people in certain situations, you know, and, and I think we're not completely sure on that. And when I talk about our research in a motivational dilemma, that is, of course, extremely dif different from your field of navigation, which is performance and negotiation. Because there's a whole nother layer, like you, like putting on top of that, that there's that there's the things that you want to do, and there's the things that you want to maybe pretend that you <laughs> that you feel, you know. And yeah. so it's a, so 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 it's just a different ball game, you know. Of, it, or it's two different questions. How do I, how, how am I true to myself when I want to do something that holds meaning in my personal life? Or how do I act as if something is true, even though it's not the truth, but how do I quote, quote, manipulate other people into thinking that this is true by working both with my emotional, verbal, bodily expression? Those are, those are just two kinds of, uh, like different kinds of, of questions. Sure. So what, what I work with is how we can influence ourselves and how we can influence others. Yeah. Now, influencing others can be in the range of being deceitful and manipulative, as you talk right. about. But it can also be manipulating people into be more collaborative. Uh, for instance, if, if I come across a jittery and nervous in a, in a setting, uh, mm -hmm. maybe I will trigger... Uh, predator-like behaviors in the other person thinking, oh, I can run over Mikkel, I can uh, take him to the cleaners. Um, if I come across very arrogant, very dominating, I might trigger the same response that, that now they are up against mm -hmm. a, a competitor. So what I'm looking at is how I can adopt a posture, a verbal opening statement, et cetera, that will uh, turn on the buttons of collaborativeness Right, uh, the, the thing that you actually want, you know, yeah, see, yeah, yeah. Them, how, how do I facilitate that in the best way with the things that I can change? Yeah, you know? without telling people how to behave, how can I behave in a way that will make them be more collaborative? Because most people have that within them. So I often talk about uh, not looking as a prey and also not looking as a predator, mm -hmm. but, but, but be in the middle of, of those two uh, sort of... Uh, right. Uh, postures and and uh, what you aspire in other people because if you can stay in that lane of not being a predator and not being a prey not all the time but very often from my experience 
which is the practical world, you will trigger a set of behaviors that will be more collaborative because from an evolutionary point of view, if you are not up against a predator and you're not up against a prey, uh, it, it will not make sense to, right. to be aggressive or something along those lines. It will. And, and then I think that that, because, because finding, finding that balance and uh, I could see, okay, you know, like you work with people, how do I find that balance? But that probably looks very different in, you know, where I work compared to where you work compared to where you have worked in the past, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and this, this idea that they, and I firmly believe that they are not specific bodily postures, like an arm here, an eyebrow there, and a leg there that signify a single emotion because it is always interpreted with respect to the context. So the same posture when I am in psychotherapy, for instance, mm. they have my words, my expression, whatever, that can, that can look very intimidating. Mm. Whereas if I'm negotiated with the most hardcore politicians in the country, maybe I would look, uh, you know, like a prey. I don't, you know, I'm, you know, I just like, you know, um, I'm taking a little bit to the extreme, but just to say that, that context matters. So, so, so we need to, uh, if we want to give a, a certain expression, we need to, of course, know the body language, but also the context. Um, and not just the context as workplace, but yeah. the emotional context prior to this and, and all these things, because, because then it, it can change in an instant what, sure. how, 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 how a bodily uh, posture is interpreted. For sure, um, and, and there can be cultural uh, differences that we know some cultures, eye gazing is uh, intimidating, etc. So uh, there yeah. are, it's always contextual and, and to some, some, some extent cultural and Maybe even gender-wise, there can be some issues. Uh, I, I, I haven't talked really into that yet. Um, so one of the things I would like to um, uh, sort of uh, also ask you, you have written the book, um, Compass of Emotions, mm -hmm. the Emotional Compasses. In that work, did, did you also work with the whole, you know, the Paul Ekman studies? Because now you, you started talking about you, uh, no single expression in an eyebrow, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but he picked up some of the work of Charles Darwin, where he started looking at, uh, do we have a certain set of basic behaviors uh, or basic emotions uh, right. primarily, primarily thought to be uh, inbuilt in our DNA or in our limbic system? Right. Um, so when you look at your work going into writing that book, Mm -hmm. uh, did you work on on that premises, or how how what is your view on Paul Ekman's studies? Well, I I grew up, and when I say grew up, I mean in a in 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 a work uh, um, in you know my education. You know, grew up within the educational system. I was told that there is like five or six basic emotions. There's you know it has these expressions. I was told that in psychology, mm -hmm. and then when I started. Um, traveling, working with emotion researchers, they were kind of laughing at that whole idea. Mm -hmm. And and then I started digging into the empirical background, and it is it ha it is extremely difficult to find empirical studies that are in support of Ekman's idea of basic emotions. Mm -hmm. And the majority of emotion researchers today they they don't think that that's the most appropriate theoretical framework for what emotions are or are not. Mm. So um, Ekman's studies, that what he did was to travel around um, the world's most farthest corners and seeing yeah. if, if people could, uh, could identify certain expressions as the same across the world. And yeah. people had a hard time replicating that it has since come, uh, you know, to uh, uh, to the surface that uh, that they were trained, that uh, that they were rewarded for certain responses. Not the stuff that he necessarily did, but the you know, but the but the studies that came after that, following the same premises. And so, so today it's difficult to find an emotion theorist that would say that that's that's the that's the most appropriate framework. So. In my book, I, I say that um, maybe what's the most basic 
it's not these emotional programs, mm. but maybe it's behavioral tendencies that sometimes is brought about by emotions. Sometimes it's brought about by other things. And then I think one, one thing that people agree upon is that that affect, not emotions, but affect. Mm. So the degree to which I'm aroused, the valence, um, am I feeling positive or negative? That 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 is something that that people agree on that that is there all the time across the human species. And yeah, but 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 not necessarily these anxiety, surprise, sadness programs. So it's, it has- it's like the, you buy into the concept of comfort and discomfort that we 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 show a range of of this place when we are comfortable, you know, anyway from being neutrally to being overly excited and then discomfort is from being slightly discomfort to being horrified. Then I'm we- not sure that it's actually even expressed oh. because, because, because I could probably show you different pictures of the same emotional expression. Yeah. And, 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 and one interpretation when you don't have the context there to kind of measure against would be a woman is very sad. But mm. then when I tell you that this woman who is crying, she uh, sees her newborn for the first time. And then you're like, oh, she's so happy and she's relieved, you know. So as soon as you get a little bit more context, these expressions, you realize that the same expression can mean so many different things, yeah. both in terms of positive positivity and negativity. Yes. So I'm not sure that certain expressions go with certain um uh positive and negative um kind of like background feelings or affective experiences surely we need to look at it in, in a context just, just much like if people do like this it might be because it's cold so there are exactly it doesn't yeah, even, are like, yeah exactly it doesn't have to mean an emotion per se no yeah. it, it, it can be a reflection of an emotional state wanting to protect yourself it can also be a contextual thing you might have an itch so touching your neck is yeah. an itch, uh, and not necessarily because you're you're uh, problem- problematic in your thoughts, whatever. Uh, so I will just wrap this up by uh, uh, saying, what is the future of of this area right now? Uh, I know you you will be conducting some future research. Uh, what do you think we will need to look at in in, in future to get more educated on on the con contact between mind and body and emotions. Right. Um, one thing that I think, well, one thing I'm personally interested in in this regard, and, and, and I think that will be informative as a whole, is to kind of explore the ways in which we agree that certain bodily postures of movements are dysfunctional or an expression of um uh, mental um, disease. We know that individuals with anxiety disorders and depressive disorders, we know that they deviate from healthy individuals in the way they walk and carry themselves. Um, and so I think knowing when certain expressions are not just changes or random alterations, but knowing when they are dysfunctional and a part of psychopathology. Mm-hmm. So that's really something that the, that 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 I'm interested in and I feel that we need to know about from a clinical perspective, know more about those issues so we can help people that have mind and body problems because the problems that we call mind problems are of course mind and body problems. Yeah. So, so, so gaining knowledge about how to help these people by knowing more about um, the external or mechanical body, the way that we carry ourselves. I think that's, 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 that's one way that we can get smarter and then it can also benefit the people in need. So that's that's where I would like to take. So in, in Amy's uh, TED Talk, she said, uh, talked about this fake it till you become it. Uh, but I think what we have touched upon in, 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 in this little uh, talk is that uh, we should work with both our mind and our body if we want to 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 become something else than what we are in right now we cannot only fake our bodily posture we need to also have the mind along to um, avoid having this negative effect that you said that if you are depressed if you are depressed or stressed and you adopt a completely opposite body posture it can have a negative effect so you need to sort of 
go on a, on, on a journey if you want to transform your internal state and also your external output. Right. That that would definitely be my uh, be my hypothesis. That of course, from time to time, you can fake it till you make it. Um, but uh, but there's so much more uh, to it than that. And and the other thing is also true that if you tell someone to uh, think more positively about themselves or whatever you do in in therapy, I feel that we also it's also our duty to work with what does that look like from a bodily expression to help those thoughts uh, along. Um, yeah, and it just uh, like with anything else, is, and and and. Uh, when you over prioritize cognition over the body or the other way around, you run into a, you run into problems. So uh, yeah. I, I hope in the future to uh, to be able to come up with with you know better treatment programs where where we do both. Very interesting. Uh, thank you, Mia. Definitely, it's an, an area in development. Uh, it's uh, very interesting to work with. We get smarter every half year when new things are published, and we get discouraged. Uh, because <laughs> it, is, it is not, it is not, it is not straightforward. Uh, uh, the research conditions uh, can have a huge impact, perhaps. Uh, so it's it, it's 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 very difficult to be completely reassured what's up and down. But at least what I take from this uh, is that we do know that it it has an effect. Yeah. At least at least on your self-reported mood, uh, it can have a positive effect to work with your uh, body posturing. Uh, but we also have some blind spots in the research that we need to look into in, in further research. So um, thank you very much uh, for uh, attending here today. And I wish you a lot of good work and, and luck in your future research on the subject. And I hope we'll be able to see more from your hand that will teach us more about ourselves and, and others. Let's keep in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you.